Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Rob. And just a huge thank you uh, to Mezda, to April, to everybody involved with putting together this wonderful weekend. I'm absolutely thrilled to be speaking to you all today. So thank you just for having me here. All right. Make sure I got this right. All right. So this is a talk about a stoneware butter churn currently on view in the William C. and Susan S. Mariner Ceramics Gallery at Mesda. And it's the story of its history, but also its stories of home, family, memory, and the eye and heart that elevate a craftsman from creator to artist. Thomas Chandler, seen here in a circa 1850 daguerreotype, is a 19th century potter who you all know very well, um, and he's mainly known for his later work, which was in Edgefield, South Carolina, uh, with some of these wonderful pieces up here. And his earliest known piece of pottery actually connects, connects his potting story back to his roots on the eastern shore of Virginia. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the object itself is a relatively simple form. It's a salt glazed stoneware butter churn, a little less than a foot tall and seven inches wide, made out of that beautifully white gray clay Baltimore stoneware is so acclaimed for and that Luke mentioned earlier. Now the incised cobalt slip decorated scene that the churn displays is an agricultural landscape with a detailed farmhouse, outbuilding, cow, five trees, and a woman churning butter in her own decorated churn. Two lug handles sit high on opposite sides of the churn, close to the neck and high collar that are also decorated with incised lines and cobalt slip. The churn is marked on its side with the name Mitchell Chandler and the year 1829, and it's signed on the bottom, Thomas M. Chandler, Maker, Baltimore, August 12, 1829. But why is so much attention paid to this scene depicted on such a workaday object? and such an everyday scene of agricultural life. I believe that the answer may lie in the particular who and what depicted in this scene and their sentimental meaning to the artist and maker. A major clue lies in the incised dedication as well as the family history of the churn itself. Thomas Mitchell Chandler Jr. was born to Thomas and Elizabeth Wise Chandler in 1810 in the town of Drummondtown in Accomack County on the eastern shore of Virginia. Drummondtown itself no longer exists as the town's name was changed to Accomack with no ending K in 1863. Thomas was at least the sixth generation in his family to be born on the eastern shore to a family that had been living in the county since the 17th century. Young Thomas's father had been orphaned at the age of 16 and sent to Baltimore, Maryland, where he was apprenticed to a Windsor chairmaker. And it was there that he married Elizabeth Wise in 1802. And soon after their marriage, the newlyweds returned to the Eastern Shore, where Chandler went to work as a Windsor chairmaker. Now, young Thomas, born in 1810, was raised in Drummondtown for the first seven years of his life. In one of the lots his father rented on Cross Street, which you can see up on the screen, until his immediate family once again moved to Baltimore in 1817. Now upon their return to Baltimore, Thomas's father set up his Windsor chair shop in an area of the city that was already heavy with craftsmen, and I know we saw a similar uh, map earlier. And there were a number of pottery manufacturers within easy walking distance of the Chandler chair shop, which is where that black dot is. It is very probable that young Thomas might have first learned the art of pottery from visiting these shops and manufactories that were so close to where he spent his teenage years. Now, the scene decorating this butter churn illustrates a landscape and lifestyle once found in 18th and 19th century small towns all over Accomack County on Virginia's eastern shore. It is in this way that the churn acts as more than just a vessel for cream and butter and becomes a vessel for memories as well. By looking at court and county records of the late 18th and 19th centuries of Drummondtown, Virginia, where the Chandler family was living from the early 17th century on, the story of a property lovingly referred to as the old place and the family that lived there 
can be explored and remembered as Thomas Chandler remembered it on his churn. Now this is a functional utilitarian piece of pottery. It's necessary for making butter a kitchen essential, but Chandler takes its functional use one step further by illustrating the churn with an image that can be viewed as a landscape painting, telling a full story of a time and place clearly marked by Chandler as the year 1829 and thus read as one would read a piece of fine art. Now we see a traditional multi-room farmhouse with a shaded porch and a wealth of descriptive details. A smaller wooden slatted outbuilding with a severely angled roof stands to the side of the house, sitting under the shade of the trees. There is an anatomically correct cow standing under the shade of yet another of the five trees so beautifully depicted. And in the foreground stands a lady with a cap covering her hair and her very own decorated stoneware churn and churning pole. The details Chandler chose to include in his landscape might seem insignificant, but they in fact reveal a whole lot, a great deal. We know the function of the churn itself, so it makes sense to view the scene depicted on it as relating to this function. For instance, the outbuilding to the side of the main house could at first be interpreted as a number of spaces, a chicken coop, slave quarters, maybe even a privy, but only if it was in a different context. As it stands, the only sensible way to read that building is as a portable dairy. These lightweight structures were made out of wood, and they would have a slanted roof overhang for shading the dairy products inside, and they were often placed either next to a well for cooling purposes, as you can see here in this reconstructed version in Colonial Williamsburg. Now, at the very least, they were placed under shade trees for those same cooling reasons, much as Chandler's placed the dairy in his landscape. Permanent freestanding dairies, like the ones you can see on the screen, can still be seen throughout Virginia, built as temples of cleanliness, cool air, and calm. But for families who use dairy products solely for personal use rather than profitable gain, a smaller portable dairy was much more sensible. Now, the details Chandler included, please excuse me, but let's just say it, they are utterly amazing. Even the ladies' churn is fully decorated with its own incised foliate design, which looks suspiciously similar to one of Baltimore Potter Henry Meyer's 1825 designs, which you can see here. Now, Myers was one of the stoneware potters working quite close to where Thomas grew up in Baltimore, as you can see by the blue dot uh, versus the black dot. And Thomas's younger brother was actually apprenticed to Myers in 1831, which is just a few years after Chandler made his 1829 churn. It seems likely that young Thomas may have seen this very churn by Myers and possibly drawn his inspiration from its floral decoration or at the very least, one exceedingly similar to it. Henry Remy, whose manufactory you can see at, back, bit, back at the green dot, was another established stoneware potter working in the Baltimore neighborhood of Thomas's youth. He was well known for his beautifully detailed pictorial scenes, such as the one on this stoneware picture of a bird and foliage. So perhaps our young potter Thomas also watched Remy at work and learned from his ability to tell a story on stone. Now, on the front of the churn, there is a wood shingled farmhouse with at least one brick side. Let's see if I can get this pointer up there. Hmm. Possibly not. I think this might have died, but that's okay. You can see that brick side over on the right. And then there's two brick chimneys and two dormer windows on the second floor. There's a full-length porch with a cat slide roof and a one-floor addition to the main house on what is likely the southern facade, since brick walls are traditionally built on the northern side of shore homes to protect from the bad weather typically coming from that direction. Now, big house, little house, colonnade, and kitchen is the general structure of a typical eastern shore home, representing additions over time and resulting in the added onto idiom so prevalent in the eastern shore vernacular. Once separate kitchen houses are often connected by a colonnade or similar connecting hall or passageway, resulting in that now traditional shore style of architecture. And the farmhouse that Chandler has illustrated is similar to many others in Acmac County, as you can see here with the brick side and dormers, as well as here, here, and up here at the David White Place. 
The side house addition, if going by traditional Eastern Shore architectural types, is likely the kitchen house, possibly connected to the main house by a hidden colonnade. Now, our Potter Thomas was just another in a long line of this family to be born and raised on the Eastern Shore. Although he lived with his parents in town until he was seven, his family had owned property and plantations in the outlying countryside for generations back. In 1781, Thomas's great-grandfather bequeathed the land and houses where he lived to his eldest son, leaving them to him and his heirs forever. Now this son, the potter's grandfather, then gave his eldest son the plantation whereon I now live, leaving the land, once again, bear with me here, to him, his heirs, and assigns forever. And now this eldest son, which was Mitchell Chandler, the potter's uncle, whose name is written on the churn being discussed, bequeathed to his eldest son all the lands called the old place where I was raised in his 1851 will. Now this property, which is so lovingly referred to by Uncle Mitchell in the twilight of his life, exposes a deep-rooted sentiment for the place where he grew up and where his family was from. And while it's unlikely that the house shown on the churn would still be the same plantation farmhouse from the potter's great-grandfather's lifetime, I do believe that this farmhouse actually is the old place belonging in the 1820s to the potter's uncle Mitchell, whose name is written above the house. Accomack County, Virginia, took its record-keeping duties so seriously in the 18th and 19th centuries that it is now possible for 21st century researchers, such as myself, to go back and read these account books with relative ease. And this allows us to not only read the wills and last testaments written by the men mentioned previously, but also records of their inventory and accounts of the sales of these households. These records provide an in-depth look into the houses and lives of these families from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And through them, it is possible to recreate the households and lifestyles that these people actually moved amongst and lived. In this case, it is possible to populate both the house and the yard on the churn with the household of old Mitchell Chandler, the potter's grandfather, directly from the items listed in his will and inventory. Going by these records, his household was filled with the belongings of a relatively well-off, middle-class family in Virginia on the Eastern Shore in the early 19th century. Eight bedsteads, furniture including walnut and mahogany tables and desks, one large looking glass, a great number of kitchen and household items, stone jugs, sets of Queen's China, silver tablespoons, teaspoons, and sugar tongs, brass candlesticks, and andirons. Oop, we're still on this page, there's some more to go. Brass candlesticks and andirons, glass tumblers, decanters, pitchers, and bottles, these all show up in the inventory. And now, in addition to all of these household items, also listed are 44 gallons of brandy, seven cider casks, and a variety of crops, farm tools, and farm animals. Whew, okay. But Mitchell Chandler's inventory and will also tell us what we're not seeing on the scene on the churn, which is that there are four enslaved people living and working on this plantation a man named Southey, a woman named Tamer, and two girls named Ginny and Miriam. Now, they would have been the people working this plantation, farming the profitable crops that allowed for such fine things as green-edged creamware platters and brass candlesticks to be bought for the family house, and allowing the white women of the house to spend their time on activities that were not bringing in substantial money, such as dairying. So the potter's decision to leave Southey, Tamer, Ginny, and Miriam out of his illustrated narrative is just as telling as if he had included their figures on his scene. So the churn had been in the family since it was first made in 1829 until just a few years ago. Family lore and the churn itself tell us that Thomas made the churn for his uncle Mitchell and his sister, Thomas's aunt Rosie Fitzgerald, née Chandler, who were both widowed by 1829. Although Thomas's immediate family had moved from the shore to the city of Baltimore in the 18-teens, it seems that young Thomas would often return to visit his extended family in Virginia. And the story handed down with the churn, generation after generation, is that when Thomas would return to the shore, his Aunt Rosie 
would make him gifts of homemade butter, rolls, and biscuits to take back to the big city. And as a thank you, Thomas made her the churn, decorated with her own likeness. So this is the story that was passed down. As the churn was passed directly down through Mitchell Chandler's descendants, up until its ownership by J. Fulton Ayers, Mitchell's great-great-grandson, and Rosie's great-great-great-nephew. So I don't know if you can tell, but I'm in love with this churn, because it's really an incredible piece. It's a functional object, but it's also an artist's rendering of his most treasured memories. Now, as an 18 or 19-year-old potter just starting out, Thomas Chandler chose to create this presentation piece for his family, a concrete, or in this case ceramic, rendering of his childhood and loved ones. Throughout the rest of his illustrious career, he never made another object quite like it that I know of. Thomas's artistic abilities do shine through in the later water cooler attributed to his hand, made in 1840 and with striking similarities in the detailing of the figures on it to Aunt Rosie in his 1829 churn. But the difference in the churn is that it is such an intensely personalized and intimate story, and nearly 200 years later, it continues to share that story with all of those who are lucky enough to view it. What other images of, exist of life on the 1820s on the Eastern Shore with this amount of personalization and detail? None that I know of, but if anybody knows of one, please let me know. Now I know our cow friend is completely astonished that it's not all about the butter, but this churn has so many different stories to tell and so many angles to tell them from. And there are likely at least five additional directions this talk could have gone down, including if the pictured farmhouse is still an excellent building on the Eastern Shore, which I'm working on, but I will leave that for another day. So once again, stay tuned. So court and census records, architectural surveys, and histories of life on the Eastern Shore in the early 19th century all make it possible to piece together a piece of the Chandler, a picture, excuse me, piece together a picture of the Chandler family of centuries past. However, if one takes the time to look and imagine, the churn tells its own story of family relationships and longing for simpler, sweeter childhood days. Thomas M. Chandler Jr. went on to move to New York, join the army, and then travel down to the Deep South, where the pottery he made ensured his name would be known by decorative arts historians and collectors for centuries to come. Yet I would argue that this churn remains his most heartfelt and moving work, a glimpse into his own vision of the memories that were most important to him. He is never known to have returned to the eastern shore of Virginia, to his childhood home or his family homestead. Now, objects as memory palaces can be powerful things, but they tend to tell us more about an imagined past built out of desire rather than reality. Still, driving along Route 13, on the eastern shore today, it is easy to look out at the farms and fields passing by and imagine that Aunt Rosie is just behind a whitewashed house, carrying her stoneware jugs from the dairy in the sweet-scented summer air, the grass already warm from the August sun, the cow cooling off under the shade of a leafy tree. The churn shows off Chandler's potting abilities in its finely turned form, functional use, decoration, glazing, and firing, but it also exhibits his gift as a true artist, telling a story of hearth and home and warm buttered biscuits that still resonates with us today. Thank you.